Hey everyone, it's Eliana Lobo again, back with another one of our founders, Cornelia Brown. Such a gift. So happy to be here with you today. Uh, folks, Cornelia not only is one of the founders, but she has a really interesting career path that is like a sandwich. You know, the first piece of bread is the academic teaching and research framing uh a central meaty portion of community service, developing and providing <laughs> skilled language interpreting services to refugees and immigrants. And then the second piece of bread, a return to academia. Cornelia has both a BA and PhD in comparative literature, the first from Stanford University and the doctorate from UC Berkeley. So, wow. And then a period of language access services to refugees and immigrants in the New York State area, and then a return to academia. Uh, many, many publications, many awards, and I'd like to read off some of the awards, if you don't mind, Cornelia, beginning <laughs> with community service, uh, community outreach hospice care in New Hartford, New York, back in 1993-94, and then followed with Diversity Achievers Award of the YWCA Syracuse in 2008, Outstanding mm -hmm. Woman of the Year, YWCA Mohawk Valley, New York, 2008, the Catherine Davis Peace Fellowship, Middlebury College, 2010, the Linguist of the Year from members of the internet, 2011, and Health Fellow of Central New York, 2014. But if you go back to the early years, you'll see that <laughs> it was a founding member of the National Council on Interpreting in Healthcare in 1998, and was also a member of the advisory committee and ended up chairing that committee. So welcome, Cornelia. I know you have some remarks prepared for us. So over yeah. to you. Thank you so much, Eliana. I appreciate your introduction. So uh, the NCIHC got us started and kept us going. We are the Multicultural Association of Medical Interpreters, MAMI, or MAMI. Thanks to the council, we launched our fee-based fee skilled interpreting to refugees and immigrants across New York from Albany to Syracuse. The council members' skill and generosity awed me. Today, I appreciate your acknowledgement and especially a chance to thank you. I joined the council in 1998, the year that Mommy Incorporated. We were neophytes and so was the field. Without the council, we wouldn't have existed. I'll focus on advocacy and interpreter training. Advocacy, we did lots. You introduced us to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that it covered not just racial minorities, but people with LEP who can't access services without skilled interpreters. The Civil Rights Act grounded all of our advocacy efforts to get facilities to pay for something unfamiliar. You linked us to the American Translators Association, giving us a national voice. You coached us on approaching hospitals, our first potential partners, whom we kept asking to pay for something they'd always had for free. Hospitals called the Civil Rights Act an unfunded mandate. The council gave us negotiating tools, research showing that trained interpreters save money. In 2001, a Utica hospital revealed its interpreting policy, quote, we have phone interpretation, but for serious appointments and operations, someone must be there. Patients must bring their own interpreter. We tried, <laughs> we tried various tactics to change their minds. Kindness, using knowledge from the council, we coached to doctors and nurses about the medical interpreter's role. It's broader than that of a court interpreter. It ensures communication and understanding between provider and patient. This expanded role, we said, helps you give good care. Fear, second tactic. The National Council Board shared horror stories from around the country about using untrained interpreters. Mommy used horror stories, hoping that hospitals would listen. Here's a mommy example from 2001. 
A Bosnian boy was in a hospital in Utica. He spoke English, not Bosnian. He didn't need an interpreter to speak with the doctor, but he couldn't interpret the doctor's words to his Bosnian speaking family. So for six days while their son lay in the hospital, the family didn't know what was wrong with him. The result, in 2002, the New York State Attorney General called us. He'd heard of our skits and wanted to interview LEP to see if they could access health care. Lawyers came to Utica and did interviews through our interpreters. One year later, the Utica newspaper ran a banner headline, Attorney General's Settlement with Two Utica Hospitals Guarantees Enhanced Language Assistance Services for Patients with LEP. <laughs> Suddenly, we had more appointments and more competition. I have a related recommendation for the council. Help us with practical tasks, growing a board, managing multiple offices, financing everything. Interpreter training. The council came through magnificently. I had the invaluable chance to present a panel on medical interpreting ethics with Bruce Downing of the council board. We stress the medical interpreter's powerful role to ensure mutual understanding. The council offered us the first ever curriculum for medical interpreting, Bridging the Gap by its own Cindy Rowan. We at MAMI use BTG as our intro text and a guide for our future trainings. We move beyond healthcare. We and local YWCAs with council advice created a course on interpreting for survivors of domestic violence. Colleagues referred us to Augustine de la Mora, who taught us court interpreting. At last, mental health interpreting, a big challenge. The council invited nationwide partners, including MAMI, to create a well-researched course, but we lacked the staff to join. Undaunted around 2015, Cindy Rote linked us to a psychology professor in Syracuse. With this fine partner, we taught an intro to mental health interpreting and hope to continue. When Cindy telephoned me a few weeks ago, I was so happy to hear her voice. She told me of this anniversary celebration. Thank you. National Council for Interpreting and Healthcare for your sharing, smarts, and tireless nurturing. To give others a voice, it takes an organization with a wonderful voice like yours. That's, I'm, I'm delighted to share my thank you with you, everyone at the National Council. <laughs> thank you, Cornelia, because we couldn't be doing this work if we didn't have an organization that you helped create behind mm -hmm. us. So again, anyone who's watching this video, I encourage you, if you're a member, become part of one of the committees or work groups. It's not a scary place to be. It's a very welcoming place and yep. shared energy of having shared values and goals is undeniable. It really helps yep. lift me up every time I work <laughs> my fellow members. So thank you, Cornelia. And I would still like to ask you one or two of the questions, if you don't mind. No, um, not at all. Can you speak to, and it's hard to narrow it down, but two or three things that helped propel you on this path, right? You went to these great schools, you okay. have the language and the interest. Mm -hmm. What got you started towards language access rather than just merely being proficient in more than one language. Okay, yeah. The first thing I'd say was my volunteer work with hospice. A communication was so important for pe with people at the end of their lives. They wanted to have some control over their life, and, and um, they wanted to be able to talk about their lives. And that really impressed me, how important... Um, care, even health care at the end of the life, how important it is to be able to communicate. Uh, then uh, in one of my study stints over in Russia, I met my future husband, and he came over to the United States and eventually brought his parents, neither of whom could speak English. So I began interpreting for them as a volunteer. 
And I saw that I felt that I didn't know how to interpret. I had worked as a translator before that for a law firm. So I kind of knew how to make the do the language transfer. And I was interested in that. But I didn't know how to act when I was in person, um, how to manage the, the, uh, the meeting of people. And I, I realized I didn't, and I realized it was important. And then l lastly, uh, going with uh, my relatives around the uh, Utica area where we had uh, like a third of the city was refugee and immigrant, I saw so many people were struggling without good interpreting services. And I met the head of the health department, and she she had had that struggle constantly, like running TB tests with people when they didn't understand the instructions. So um, after I taught a year at Hamilton College, she came in and met me and said, just raised the um, kind of an invitation of helping to organize or leading the organization of a, of a service that for the first time would provide skilled interpreting, not just in the Utica area, but all over upstate New York, because there wasn't anyone to train interpreters. Um, and so it just, I guess it caught my sort of not just my imagination, but my heart. I knew it was really important. And I thought I, I'd be proud to be part of that effort if that answers you. And then, of course, when I found out about the National Council, that was uh, just a wonderful gift, as I tried to explain. Without the Council's expertise and perspective, we couldn't have succeeded with our with our project. And <laughs> what would you say, um, how would you summarize, and that's a very tall <laughs> order, uh, the National Council and your participation as a member, uh, whether it's looking back or looking forward, either either direction works. Okay. Um, well, I wrote, I just mentioned in my remarks how odd I felt, which was my, like my first impression. I really, it wasn't just actually people's skill and generosity. It was all the things they knew, their connections. And, and <clears throat> so that was part of how I felt like a but I didn't just feel like a recipient, actually. I felt that I had something to give. And I, I think that was because of the smallness of our organization and the need for it. So, um, you know, it's kind of like the relationship between God and the people, quote unquote. We were sort of the homework for the for the council in a, in a certain way. And we, um, I'm sure we, we weren't the only ones, but we were a really small grassroots organization. And I believe that the council wanted to be able to help people like us. Um, and then, um, yeah, so let's see. Well, for example, we could, we could try out council ideas. And one of them would be that horror story technique that really worked very well for us. Um, and another, of course, was the knowledge they, they gave us about the um, Civil Rights Act. So, um, I mean, I we constantly learned, and I, I would convey that what we learned, what I had learned to, to the um, staff at MAMI, but we put things into um, action also. And I, I imagine that was good for the council. I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I am struck by what you said. We constantly learn. I think that's part of an interpreter's makeup, right? We're never done because language is a no. living. We're all right. always having to keep up with our learning. But then right. what do we do with that? How do we put that into action? And that exactly. is where I think maybe we could expand our training, right? How do we mm -hmm. make what we want to see happen in our world actually happen in, in our world? <laughs> yes, that that is right. And and sometimes we we do have succeed successes, and we can see ourselves making steps forward, even though there's always more to do. But that was that was really thrilling too. I, I mentioned the mental health interpreting project that unfortunately we didn't have the staff to join, but I know that would have been a terrific learning experience, and I I hope it happened. Um, I know mental health interpreting is a really good example of a challenging dialogue, uh, which you know is sort of the maybe the heart of what's so fascinating about interpreting. But in mental health, of course, uh, therapists have a particular way, particular strategies about running the dialogue, and you need to teach that as part of the course. Uh, so I think we've yeah. got to work in terms of 
being able to shift provider perspective and instead of seeing the interpreter as merely a tool, a translation tool, they see yeah. you as the interpreter as someone that perhaps needs yeah. to be given some information at the pre-session or what the goal is or have everybody pointed in the same direction before you actually get started. And in this year's annual membership meeting, mental health interpreting training was something mm -hmm. that was brought up by more than one member as a, a desire to see yeah. uh, more training made available and perhaps maybe even mm -hmm. with certification specializing in mental health interpreting. So that's a lot of cogs in the wheel, both inside and outside NCIAT, mm -hmm. but I hope to see those wheels begin to turn in the right direction. Yeah, so thank that's you for getting us started on this journey. Thank you for building the framework that got us on track to be able to move towards language access, social justice, better health outcomes. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Mm -hmm. Our membership thanks you, and I thank you. Well, you you are so welcome, and you, I admire you because you're constantly giving everyone a voice, and I appreciate your giving me a voice today. It was very important. Thank you. <laughs>